Well, um, thank you very much for joining us on what is obviously not a particularly nice evening uh, weather-wise. Um, I think we're going to miss the brunt of uh, Storm Christoph. I love where they get these names from. Um, but nevertheless, I, I'm sure you're aware it's been pretty grim here all day, just pouring with rain. Um, so as soon as I put my first slide up, I'm taking back, taken back to my summer because I don't know about you, I found the first lockdown almost bearable because, um, you know, I was enjoying pottering around my garden. And as I worked so hard lecturing and uh, guiding, um, it was initially quite a welcomed respite. I think I'm well over that now. Uh, so this particular talk on the Arts and Crafts Guard is very focused on Surrey. Uh, I'm sure, in fact, that many of you will know quite a few of the gardens that you're going to see. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to add to the story because we're going to start off with Miles Burkett Foster and Helen Allingham and the whole way in which really the Arts and Crafts Garden is, to be perfectly frank, a fiction. It's something that we made up in the 19th century uh, by blending different elements together, medieval, renaissance and, you know, even Baroque in the case of the concept of the parterre, uh, to come up with something ironically uh, quintessentially English. This is probably not a Lutchen's house, which you're so familiar with. It's Chintzhurst, if I'm saying that correctly. We will come back to it later. But like I said, I initially want to start off with thinking about the way in which the Arts and Crafts Garden um, came into being. So I thought the best place to start was William Morris. Uh, key figure, um, said to be the father of the arts and crafts movement. And this is Red House, which sadly he only lived in for a short time. Um, the uh, weather vane says 1859, and it's right at the top of the building, obviously. And he had to move out in 1865 for a variety of reasons, financial and health. And he also needed to be much closer to his base of operations once he founded uh, you know, what was going to become Morris & Co. Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Co. originally, and he needed to be much nearer to Red Lion Square, which was the original um, location of um, his various enterprises. So because he wasn't there for very long, we don't have a very good record of what the garden actually looked like. There are, there's no decent uh, photographs because, you know, we're, we're, we're early, early 1860s. Uh, we do have one or two indications and the National Trust has always said that its long-term aim is to reconstruct the garden at Red House, um, but really it's only an echo of its former glory. The house, I've always thought, is rather French in feeling. It may be that wishing well in the centre. And we do know that the garden would have had a lot of trellis work, uh, because we know that the garden inspired his earliest wallpapers, uh, which were put into production around about 1865. So this, of course, is rose and trellis, and I'm sure you're familiar with daisy and fruit, or sometimes known as pomegranate. I mean, they are classic, aren't they, uh, Morris designs. Though initially the wallpapers were not that successful, primarily because they cost an awful lot of money to produce. So we can, we can sort of glean some information on what the garden at Red House might have looked like uh, from the settle, uh, which is immediately inside the front door of Red House as you go in. As the settle appears to depict uh, Morris and his closest friends in the garden at Red House. The lady behind the bench, uh, dressed in red, uh, may be a Red Lion Mary their sort of faithful servant. But the two protagonists that you're looking at sat on the bench appear to be Morris himself and Jane Burden. And you can see immediately behind them a row of, of rather well-controlled fruit trees, which inspired one of his um, embroidery designs. He was going to drape the dining room with a sequence of embroideries on the theme of Chaucer's Good Women. They were going to be interspersed, as you can see here, in the fragment that survived of St. Catherine, and one of the fruit trees was actually uh, completed. But we can see a, a better idea of what it might have looked like by looking at that very early stained glass uh, window design, which was for Walter Dunlop's home at Harden Grange, uh, Bingley in Yorkshire. Uh, they are no longer in that house, but the windows have survived. And I managed to find the medieval garden at Chantoise, 
uh, to give you an idea of the wattling that would have been a major feature of the medieval garden and also of red houses at garden there would have been a, some sort of pergola there definitely would have been an arbor there would have been classic english flowers like roses because essentially the arts and crafts garden was going to blend be the beauty of flowers with the practicality of being a working garden you'll see what i mean as we go through and the flowers are as much for the bees as for the pleasure of the occupants uh, we have a better idea of what Kelmscott would have looked like because of course not only are we looking at a garden that morris enjoyed until his death in 1896 we also do indeed have photographs of it and watercolors courtesy of Marie Spartani Stillman. These are going to date to around 1890. We know from um, various letters and diaries that Marie Stillman was a, was a regular guest at Kelmscott in the late 1880s, early 1890s. And I'm showing you here the long walk uh, uh, painted by Stillman on the left-hand side. And that's it sort of looked quite recently not quite so profuse in terms of the flowers. Now you can pick out the ine inevitable hollyhock on the bottom um, image. But the idea again, I think, is to reconstruct the sort of rather um, slender fence that appears to have run behind the herbaceous border. The important thing is to remember that herbaceous borders were not invented by Gertrude Jekyll. She did many things, but she did not invent the herbaceous border as a concept it goes back to the Elizabethan era or even earlier. Uh, here's another one just showing you the profusion and the love of vertical plants, hollyhocks, uh, delphinium, delphiniums, lupins, here a profusion of them on the left hand side. Uh, rather, I'm very, very boringly simply labelled a lady in the garden at Kelmscott Manor also by Marie Stillman. And um, May Morris has also left watercolours of what the garden looked like. So we do have quite a good idea of what uh, Kelmscott looked like in its heyday under Morris's occupancy. If we come round the front of the house, uh, the rose trees, you know, very clipped running up to the front door, they were made really famous in the frontispiece for news from nowhere. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this topiary. In case you hadn't realised, this is supposed to be Fafnir, a dragon from Iceland that Morris initially encountered on his Icelandic adventures. If you remember, he uh, acquired Kelmscott on a lease with uh, Rossetti and then immediately left for Iceland, leaving our lovers in their little, um, you know, idyll, that's Rossetti and Jane, at Kelmscott. Uh, so this is Fafnir. I, I've always thought she looks more like a beached whale uh, than a dragon. But as we're about to discover, topiary is a really important element in any um, arts and crafts garden, whether it's box or you. It's well, the, the most dramatic uh, topiary is undoubtedly you. And the garden that they really looked up to uh, is the famous one in Cumbria. This is Levens Hall, uh, where, I mean, it looks, you know, like the topiary could also turn itself into a chess set. Uh, like this, it's like, almost like a pawn, doesn't it? And um, the history of this garden, well, the main thing is that you can date it right the way back to Charles II and the so-called Restoration Period. So the topiary is some of the oldest uh, in England. So box in the foreground and you for the magnificent topiary. This is like um, an archway with a crown on top. Uh, topiary, however, is not something simply associated with grand English uh, country houses. There's a lovely story about Rossetti. Um, he liked to collect weird, weird stuff and he wandered off uh, into the countryside and fell in love with a topiary chair that he found outside a cottage. The legend is that he had the topiary chair cut and sent back to Chelsea when inevitably it died. Um, but topiary is very much a part of even the most modest um, country uh, garden. So here we are at Whitley. This is Miles Burkett Foster where he is going to build uh, his dream home as you'll see in a minute. He was um, a Quaker in terms of his origins and the family originally came from Yorkshire 
but he makes his name really at painting the home counties. He never wanted his country's to, uh, cottages to be restored. He wanted them to look like this one. And de Chabelet, I love the, the way that the, the roof, the rippling of the roof and the sort of everything slightly lopsided. And he always maintained that picturesque cottages like this were much more interesting than ones that had been restored. His figures tend to be what we refer to as staffage. That's the same figure used over and over again and to create interest or to give scale. And you can add several thousand pounds to any of these paintings uh, when you spot the cat, as you can see there uh, down at the bottom. So here is Miles Burkett Hoster. So he comes up, I would say, the hard way. Um, he's not a fine artist initially. Um, he makes his money as a book illustrator and in the world of printmaking. But he's so successful by the early 1860s with his illustrated books that he turns to producing watercolours. And he becomes undoubtedly, by the time of his death in 1899, the most famous watercolour artist of English country houses, well, in particular cottages and their associated gardens. He was able to build for himself a house which I would love a time machine uh, to go back to. So initially he moved to Tigbourne Cottage, uh, then he acquired um, a parcel of land on Wormley Hill and built the house with the inevitable name of the hill, which uh, survived until the 1950s. And it's one of the, the great losses, I think, because it had the most spectacular uh, William Morris interior. Burne Jones paintings of St George and the dragon, there's a whole sequence of them. Over mantles, the famous tiles on themes derived from Sleeping Beauty and Beauty and the Beast. So, you know, if I had a time machine, it would be undoubtedly to go back and to see the hill in all its glory. I've got two uh, photographs here. So you, I like to collect old postcards, but the image on the left hand side, uh, photographed by a Miss Evans, um, probably uh, related to the famous publisher Evans. Uh, is 1898 and then on the other side the photograph is about 1910. Okay so this is how he made his reputation through these illustrated uh, books. So pictures of English landscape 1862. So the, the for, for Burkitt Foster the gardens are a bit of a sideline. He's more attracted to the idea of an English countryside that is rapidly disappearing particularly in Surrey with the coming of the railways. The houses are going to be bought up, they're going to be done up, and they are going to become a stockbroker belt material. He was very attracted to things like, you know, the inn scene that you're looking at on the left-hand side. They're all sat around outside the inn. You can see it's the lion, the sign is in the tree, and we have horses at watering. He was also very keen on country crafts. It's capturing this idea of an England that is rapidly disappearing because of urbanization and obviously many people leaving the countryside to find work in the cities. So you'll have lots of carpet baggers in a Burkitt Foster uh, drawing. So here we've got a chair mender, you'll find the china peddler. You know, he's very keen in this, uh, on this idea of country crafts and the country way of life. Not surprisingly, when he strikes out as a watercolor artist, he was going to earn a great deal more uh, through that medium than his illustrations in books. But nevertheless, watercolours uh, play second fiddle to oils. If you were lucky, you know, you might get five, ten guineas for a watercolour. That's the sort of average price. And Burkitt Foster would actually charge you a guinea uh, to authenticate his work, uh, because even during his lifetime, um, he was much uh, plagiarised. So please don't buy any on eBay. They're not likely to be my Miles Burkitt Foster. So here we have the little girl by the doorway in pictures of English landscape of 1862. And there it is transformed into the watercolour. As you can see, it's, it's quite a scrubby garden, isn't it? There's some daffodils and some primroses. So we know it's spring. And there is in the inevitable, as you can see, kitten and cabbages. And in the original black and white image, it, the cabbages again are important, as is the beehive. So it's this idea, again, of a garden that uh, is working as well as picturesque. 
So I uh, actually had, to, I couldn't actually find many really good images of gardens. It was much more simply him uh, capturing scenes of Surrey life like sand hole lane here, sometimes the sand and the hole are one word, in Hambledon. You can see the cottages up on the left hand side, uh, the thatch looking a little the worse for wear. And we have a mother who has stopped to tend her baby and they've clearly been out collecting wood. And you can see here again, it's this sort of idyll of a wholesome but quite tough life in the countryside. Here's a better garden. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what in this is. It clearly is an inn. You can see from the bo sign board, board on the left hand side. Um, I love the way she's put her washing over that sort of falling down shack on the left hand side. And again, it's this idea of picturesque variety. Everything is slightly tumbled down and our figure is cutting cabbages. She appears again. This is what I mean by a staffage figure. She just appears over and over again usually engaged in some sort of activity and in this one again she's simply cutting cabbages. Uh, this is uh, simply called that by the way and we've got rambling roses uh, as you can see on the left hand side. The two children don't be confused um, by the fact that boys are dressed uh, in, in dresses uh, till at least the age of five when they are breached and also the colour for boys in the 19th century is pink not blue. So that's just as likely to be an infant boy as it is um, a girl. And the reason for that is that red was the really masculine colour, so it's due to reason that pink being a shade of red should be masculine. Anyway, it is rather a scrubby garden as you can see. And what always amazes me about Burkitt Foster, uh, you know, watercolours is it's always, the sun is always shining. It's, it's for the most part it's always summer. Um, everybody is incredibly clean. As you know, living in the countryside, many children were very disadvantaged. They wouldn't necessarily even have shoes. They, might, they may never go to school. Uh, they, were too, they were needed to work the land. It was only in the cities that children were really made to go to school, uh, you know, until about the age of nine. And even in then, if you look at factories, you'll find children of eight and seven. It was a tough life. So these are very middle class in terms of the way that they are depicting life in the countryside. And our little girl is coming home, over the, going over the um, stepping stones to a garden that has sunflowers. They are absolutely essential in the English cottage garden. You will not find one anywhere that does not have sunflowers. I don't know if they'd read a surfeit of Tennyson, Heavily hangs the broad sunflower, <coughs> excuse me, or if they had uh, read their Blake, um, you know, the whole idea of the sunflower being anthropomorphic. So um, definitely you need sunflowers in your English uh, garden. So here's what I mean about sort of tidying up the countryside and giving the illusion that people, you know, for people who wanted, the people who wanted to buy these watercolours lived in the city and they wanted an idyll. They didn't want to see how tough life in the countryside really was. How many labourers would be able to stop and have tea in the afternoon? Uh, all of these artists had props in their studios. A lot of the children wear antiquated costume, sort of almost giving you the, the idea that you might be looking at 20 or 30 years you know, ago, which again would help to create this idea of a lost English um, idyll. Again, please note the cat. Helen Allingham therefore comes along in the wake of Miles Burkett Foster and again she is not initially associated with painting cottages. Um, as uh, um, unmarried she was again known as an illustrator. Her maiden name is Helen Patterson and she comes from Swaddling Coat. She had a very disadvantaged youth in the sense that her father was a doctor and he died of diphtheria which broke the family up. Her mother simply couldn't afford to keep the family together and young Helen was sent uh, to uh, the outskirts of Birmingham to be raised by her aunts. So you know she you know when I say she was disadvantaged I mean emotionally she was disadvantaged. Uh, she on the plus side she was able to attend um, 
Art School in Birmingham and the newly flourishing Metropolitan Art Schools, the Municipal Art Schools, were creating new opportunities for women. So Helen will initially, like Birgit Foster, be an illustrator, but rather than books, she very much concentrated on illustrating magazines or newspapers like the Illustrated London News, which was very lucrative. In fact, too lucrative. So when she married the Irish poet William Allingham in 1874, um, she was really in a bit of a quandary because she couldn't be seen to be earning more than her husband. So this is when she really turned to producing watercolours. The cottages will become much more prominent um, in her paintings because her Irish poet husband, William Allingham, was very much in the arts and crafts milieu, a great friend of Tennyson, as you'll see in a minute. One of the reasons why they moved to Sand Hill is because of the, they want, prox they want to live near um, Alfred Tennyson. But also uh, Allingham is very involved with William Morris's Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And whereas Morris was able to wage a war against the restorers of cathedrals, it was much harder to wage a war against the despoilers of Surrey cottages, uh, which were literally being ruined. And so uh, Helen, Helen's images have become very important because many of the cottages that she delineated over and over again, to be honest, I'm um, in the immediate area of Sandhill, are no longer with us, or if they are, they have been radically, radically changed. She too will use staffage figures. Her figures tend to be quite small, as the main emphasis is the cottage. The little girl here is wearing an antiquated headdress. So like Birkett Foster, she had a whole series of props in her studio. As the leaded windows were being ripped out, she had to keep a set of those to reinsert them into her paintings. And she would have had things like bird cages as well, which would have added to the picturesque quality of her images. So the photographs show you a young Ellen, an older Helen. Uh, she was widowed, I'm afraid, for far too long. And uh, William Allingham down the bottom. So they start to travel into, in fact, um, Helen Allingham was traveling into Surrey um, even before she married, when she was still um, under her maiden name. Helen Patterson. Uh, and uh, the Allinghams themselves, well, they definitely prefer going to the area around Hazelmere for their holidays. Uh, here she is delineating the White Horse Shear at Surrey. Uh, the watercolour dates to 1878. And this hasn't changed too much, to be quite honest. Um, you could, rec could recognise most of those um, elements if you went to Shear today. She moved into a modern house. She didn't move into something that needed doing up. And she lived, or well, they lived, with her growing family. There are three children all together, who you will see as Staffage figures. And they will live at Sand Hill between 1881 and 1888, uh, when they moved back into London because of William Allingham's uh, failing health. Long after he dies, she will carry on producing watercolours that they will be closer to her London home. She will travel to Pinner or to the Weald, uh, Kent and Sussex. And one gets the impression that, um, you know, she can only really return to Surrey as a weekend painter rather than being there full time. The publication of Happy England, which is Helen Allingham working with Marcus Huish in 1904, again becomes a wonderful vehicle for selling not only her watercolours, but also this mythic England. Uh, Graham, William Graham Robertson will move in to Sand Hill uh, when he, um, as the next, I should say, next tenant, uh, when she moves and, well, she and her family move out. And you can see it's in a sort of Queen Anne style, can't you? Uh, with very obvious tile hanging. I've never seen it. It's uh, cut off uh, by lots of foliage uh, from the main road. So one of the reasons that they want to move to this neck of the woods is that, well, there are already a lot of artists in Surrey. Um, it all starts really with Henry Cole. Um, he moves out to Surrey and builds a house. Um, his house is then acquired by George Eliot, uh, the famous novelist. Then Lord Tennyson acquires the Oldworth estate, which is Blackdown. He will eventually leave this for the Isle of Wight. 
uh, because too many tourists come in search of him uh, whilst he's living in Surrey. Uh, according to, again, a lovely bit of uh, anecdotal mythology, um, they were very close, the Allinghams, with Lord Alfred Tennyson, and evidently he took Helen for a walk on the estate and showed her this rather lovely cottage near Black Blackdown, which she painted on numerous occasions. And Vine Cottage, uh, which is indeed covered in vines on the left-hand side, was also on the Oldsworth estate. That was changing hands the last time I looked, but I don't know uh, what's happened to it. So Sand Hill is very near uh, Whitley, which as you know is sort of like almost an entire National Trust property now. The village is, is beautiful, well, preserved in aspect almost. We can have an argument, not an argument, but we can have a discussion about the difficulties of preserving the character and fabric of the village, and yet it still has to be a living, working entity. So this was literally a few yards from where they lived. And um, Annabelle Watts has done a stalwart job, particularly for Bo uh, Bonhams, identifying the cottages and even who lived in them. So through Annabelle Watts, we know that the Moore family occupied the left side, while Percy Hardy and his sister lived on the right. Again, you can see how small the figure is. Um, it really is there just to give you an idea of the size of the house. Uh, this one is a cottage at Grey's Wood, which was really a hamlet. I think there was a tap room, not my expression, um, but a, a Victorian one, a tap room and a few cottages. It really was a hamlet. It wasn't a, clearly not, you know, up to the status of a village. But we know that this was quite one of her earlier watercolours because it was owned by the publisher George Bell um, by 1884. And, uh, you know, this is the world that Helen moved in. It was um, a literary world more than anything else. Please note the kitten and the sunflowers on the left hand side and that everything is rather ramshackled. So a, lo a lot of the cottages remain rather anonymous. Here peeking over the hedge you can see, yes, the lupins and the sunflowers in an old Surrey cottage. Again, this has been identified as being near Oxted and again it pops up in several of Helen's paintings. Please note the little dovecot or ducat in the background. Again, Annabel Watts uh, clearly got a good eye for spotting the cottages. Chiddingfold was particularly popular with many artists. So this is simply entitled A Cottage at Chiddingfold. And this conceit of the mother with the baby and then the person who's either coming or going up the path is something that Helen Allingham uses over and over again. Um, as to the washing, as you can see, spread over the hedge on the right hand side. Francis Frith, of course, is important for capturing these uh, cottages and village life as it was disappearing. And the uh, rather charming postcard of the old crown in Chiddingfold, still there, hardly changed, um, actually dates to about the First World War era. Uh, this is Pook Hill Chiddingfold and actually I think operates as a and b but I wanted to include it because this pretty much has, well it's cleaned up, but it hasn't been too badly altered. I wanted to remind you about some of the very obvious Surrey features, uh, particularly the tile hanging, little scallop shaped ones and uh, rectangular ones. Uh, pan tiles of course are associated with Tunbridge Wells. The tile hanging is such a quintessential uh, Surrey motif, what we know in the trade as the vernacular, building in local materials and in a local style. Balewood Farm uh, could not be called a cottage, could it? It's really what uh, would be best described as a yeoman farmhouse, a really splendid legacy of the medieval era. The black and white photograph down the bottom is from Country Life, and dates to the 1930s. They obviously rented a load of doves to go on the roof and I love the geese or waddling and I managed to find this more recent photograph uh, on the internet. So Vale Wood Farm again has been spared the worst of the doer uppers. Here it is as it appears in one of Helen Allingham's most famous uh, watercolours and hopefully you can see the profusion of flowers. Yes, lupins, hollyhock and sunflowers. Uh, 
And by the time you get to the sort of eight, later 1880s, 1890s, she starts to paint many more gardens. You can actually relatively easily identify a lot of the flowers. Uh, this one is simply entitled Near Hambledon. Uh, this is Gerald and the baby in pink is Harry. These were her two favourite sons. Uh, she had a daughter called Evie, um, who I'm afraid she was a little bit cruel to uh, because Evie was a little bit of a slow learner. Helen put all of her eggs, I'm afraid, um, into, the, uh, into the basket of her sons. They were, she doted on them. Um, Evie, by comparison, I think, had rather a tough time. Uh, so this was, uh, cottage was very gay, close to Sand Hill, uh, literally was evidently in the field at the bottom of her garden. So within easy ailing distance. And uh, you can see here what I mean about picking out the flowers. You can definitely see some violets or pansies. Uh, there's some red hot pokers on the left hand side, some lilies and some irises. And the same flowers can be picked up here in what might be the same house, but from a different view. Uh, but I love the cap that this is simply called a gardener in a cottage garden. But importantly, look at those cabbages. It reminds you that this was still a garden where the flowers are there for the bees and it has to um, sustain the occupants as well as looking beautiful. That might be Evie holding at Harry. As I said, well, you know, it was a very difficult relationship between Helen Allingham and her daughter Evie. So here we are at Brook, where again, uh, delphinium stand out. Uh, sunflowers, again, you know, get a magnifying glass on that. Uh, and you can see, I, or you can identify many of the flowers. The old cottage garden, uh, the name of the cottage is Sister Cottage. It was the post office at Brook. And again, all of these um, uh, places are close to Sand Hill. And uh, the cabbages, again, are a dominant feature of the old cottage garden. However, she did paint more splendid gardens gardens associated with manor houses and the next generation of watercolour artists, people like Samuel Elgood, you'll meet them in a minute, I've got a few to show you, they will abandon cottages and go for the gardens of our great English country houses. I have not identified this particular old manor, I do apologise, but it's likely to be Surrey or Kent. I do like the lilies on the left hand side and we appear to have a pre-Raphaelite lady uh, wandering through the garden. And this is a sort of good link uh, to, uh, of course, uh, Gertrude Jekyll, because obviously the gardens that she designed were, and may have been based on the concept of the cottage garden, but they were certainly for much more ambitious houses. She begins her life as a painter and only really took up gardening when her eyesight began to fail. There was never really any need for her to make a living. She came from a very wealthy family. If you've been to visit the museum in Godalming, you'll know that she was quite radical, that she supported the suffrage movement. She wasn't a suffragette. She was very much on the side of uh, Millicent Fawcett, not Mrs. Pankhurst. And so she were agitated peacefully uh, for the vote, but she embroidered the banner, in fact, uh, for the Godalming chapter of the uh, suffrage uh, movement. She wasn't really as, I think, as innovative as many people uh, think she was, in the sense that she had the advantage of reading all of the books that were being published by people like William Robertson, that's 1883, The English Flower Garden. And uh, William Roberts, Robinson is often seen to be really one of the, again, one of the forefathers of the concept of the cottage garden. And the, the blousy herbaceous border will undoubtedly become her hallmark. The idea again was to plant low uh, speed specimens down the bottom and then and to, to work from cool colours uh, to bold oranges, oranges and reds in the centre. We see her with her spade at the top, gardening at Munstead House uh, around about 1878. Those are, is the famous portrayal of her boots. I love the way they're falling apart uh, by William Nicholson. And in Godalming, you'll actually see the real boots. 
So this is just to remind you that the herbaceous border was not invented by Gertrude Jekyll. This is Arley Hall in Cheshire. Now it had a Victorian herbaceous border as early as 1846, but um, according uh, to their history, as published on their website, this is Arley Hall I mean, uh, it was uh, on a Tudor model and you can see how again it's framed by topiary. George Samuel Elgood from Leicester, believe it or not, one of Leicester's most famous sons, uh, really makes his name painting these big gardens, traveling around throughout the summer. And again, he will use Staffage figures, sometimes they're in period costume, sometimes as here they appear to have been dressed up in aesthetic clothing, uh, rather Art Nouveau looking, and sometimes he will populate his gardens with picturesque peacocks. Uh, two views of the herbaceous border. I rather like the sort of covered arbor, a very splendid, or more like an orangery, at the end of the border. That's the lower uh, right-hand side. I'm not a botanist, so if I get any of the flowers wrong, you can have a go at me later. Then, of course, it is the relationship between Lancia, uh, sorry, full name, uh, Sir Edwin Lutyens and uh, Gertrude Jekyll that really sort of cements this idea of the English cottage garden. Uh, Lutyens was a local lad, um, as, as am I originally. I'm actually from Shepparton, which was Middlesex, but is now Surrey. Uh, he grew up in Thursley, and we understand that he was an avid sketcher of the uh, local cottages, and it was whilst he was out sketching uh, that he spotted uh, Gertrude Jekyll uh, jogging past in her dog cart, which she habitually used, and a conversation started, and this is how the relationship was formed. Uh, they met soon after he set up an independent practice. So he started in the offices of Ernest George and Harold Pito. Garden enthusiasts will recognize the name of Harold Pito. He's a really important garden designer, of Scott Park, I think, being his most famous uh, achievement. And Ernest George was an architect, and he built Li Limmer's Lease, or Limer's Lease, which of course is the home of the Watts, as in George Frederick and Mary. I wouldn't call uh, Limmer's Lease truly arts and crafts. I think there's still a lot of legacy of the um, preceding style, you know, the Queen Anne look with its sort of like faux half timbering. Anyway, the important thing is that Lutchen sets up on his own in 1888 and he meets uh, Gertrude shortly after. Goddard's is one of his, I think, best known houses. Not his most splendid, but it's so well known because, as you know, um, it's a landmark trust property, uh, but also it's the home of the Lutchen Society. Uh, so it's extended in 1910, so it moves from being a home for disadvantaged ladies, I do like that idea, uh, to being a home for the Miralees family, and they made their money out of shipping. So it has like a, a medieval feel to it. You have almost like a little um, secluded medieval hortus conclusus in the centre. And by the way, in any uh, Lutchen's Ducal Garden, you must have a sundial. So my two photo, my two paintings of them. Uh, I love, I love the top one because he looks like Captain Mannering, doesn't he? I'm sorry. And uh, the bottom one, of course, is uh, Gertrude Jekyll older, uh, an older Gertrude Jekyll by Orpen. And this is a slightly a better view, because I think the idea of this garden, you can see it better even here, was that when it was a home, a summer home for disadvantaged ladies who were coming here to sort of, as respite, you can sort of imagine them coming out of the communal dining area, which is immediately behind you, uh, with all of the little lattice windows you can imagine them coming out and just sitting around the garden you know after lunch or in the evening and just enjoying uh, the general ambiance love that so here's at chintzhurst i do hope i'm pronouncing that correctly which is near wanish uh, in the surrey hills uh, this may not be so familiar to you i certainly didn't know much about it until it recently came on the market um, so it was built, as you can see, between 1893 and 1895 on a rather precipitous site, which gives you magnificent views out over the Surrey Hills. This is one of his, if not his first, one of his, one of his earliest collaborations uh, with Gertrude Jekyll. And it was built 
uh, for a local woman, a wonderful name, um, em uh, Amelia Guthrie. Unfortunately, Amelia didn't actually stay there for very long. She was, it was already on the market by 1897, purchased by Lord Rendell for his widowed daughter, Rose Goodhart. The name might be familiar to uh, arts and crafts aficionados uh, because growing up at Chinthurst uh, will sway her son's vision and he'll grow up to be an architect. Uh, Goodhart Rendell, he agreed to take on his grandfather's name and he'll eventually become, um, if I'm correct, president of the RIBA. Most recently, it was owned by Mrs. Graham Bonner Carter, who made her money as an art dealer. When she acquired it, it was split up into flats and she's put it back into one big house. So you had to have a very deep pocket to buy a Chinthurst. Uh, this is uh, Jekyll describing it. That she wanted it to look timeless and have a piece that she called something of a convent. Now, as you can see, it's more pathway and topiary than it is flowers. Uh, because, of course, Jekyll Gardens uh, are really dri driven by Lutchen's architecture. You must have a Lutchen's bench, like the one this lady is sitting on at the end of the garden. Um, it's, this is the parterres that I was talking about earlier. You know, you can relate them to Baroque parterres, but the obvious derivation of those mid uh, medieval wattles that created boxes that you put flowers in, but now the boxes are created using little short box edges. Uh, Hatchlands also therefore has a, a Jekyll garden uh, because this was also acquired by Stuart Rendell, who will become Lord Rendell. In 1900, he commissioned Gertrude Jekyll to design a parterre garden, but it, nothing comes of that. And then it's his son, Ahal, who brings Jekyll back, asks for another set of plans. She draws up two uh, planting schemes. He opts for peonies and roses. You can see again how very formal this is. Uh, with, there's always a sculpture or a sundial in the centre and a series of boxes. But here's another view of it. I think the Trust is hoping to eventually restore this back to peonies and roses. So uh, she will obviously commission her own home uh, from Lutchen. So this is Munstead Wood. And I've always been rather impressed by the fact that she never married, she never had children, that she didn't understand the concept of downsizing at all. Uh, there is a special accommodation made for the owls. They had like a, a nesting area created for them. Um, in the roof. And again, a rather like Helen Allingham, what will make her really famous are the books. So some English uh, gardens published in 1904. It uses local um, Bargate stone. It's that lovely golden colour, as you can see. I'm just admitting somebody who's arrived a bit late to the party. Uh, so here, I've always fancied the gardener's cottage. Uh, so of course, it's one of the reasons why English arts and crafts gardens are hard to maintain as they take a lot of work. So this was the uh, cottage built uh, by uh, Lutchens for her head uh, gardener, who was Swiss in terms of his origins. Not quite sure how you pronounce his name, but I'll give it a go. Zumbach. Okay, 1898. I love the cat slide roof. They come from Dorset and they are called that because literally cats slide down them. And they come about because people put additions onto their cottages and the roofs just get carried on over the addition. And you end up with these amazing low hanging, you know, eaves. You can see some tile hanging in the background as well. And uh, Lutchen's half timbering is, is always functional. It's not like between the wars when people glued it onto the front of their building you know, like swathes of suburbia. Um, so the crock shape that you've got here, it's like a Y, um, very distinctive technique for building with, you know, in timber, but building in timber that is weight bearing and constructional. It's not just there to look pretty. And as you move around Munstead, as you know, each uh, facade is different. This is also a key ingredient of the arts and crafts idiom. So we're looking here at a contemporary watercolour. 
You can see it hasn't changed very much. It has a luncheon bench, a profusion of lilies on the right hand side. And this um, is concealing the tank garden, as it's called, uh, which I have borrowed because I have not been to visit Munstead for years. Uh, it's easier to get into uh, now uh, because Annabelle Watts, I think, is in charge of the garden. And, um, but you have to go in a group of less, well, 15 or ideally less. That's the maximum number that uh, Annabelle is prepared to cope with. Uh, I'm afraid it's got netting over the water because of the goldfish and the local herons. But here's a, a slightly more a charming view of the tank garden. And I wanted to include this because this is the back door uh, to Jekyll's flower room. To remind you that she saw the garden again as a working entity. She would cut the flowers and they would be sold at market. And this would you know, create something, I won't say cottage industry, but certainly bought um, work to you know the locals who had to cut the flowers and get them to market. Uh, these images are how the garden looked in 1912 courtesy of Country Life. You can see here uh, the splendour of the herbaceous borders and how she would plant an area with one particular colour. Uh, the grey garden is so called because most of its plants have grey foliage and all the carpeting and bordering plants are grey or whitish. Now this is the concept of the uh, sal de verdue, the, the green room, uh, so beautifully exemplified at Hidcote at, and Sissinghurst. And you sort of build from your cool grey colours to warmer colours in the centre. I particularly like the profusion of purple on the right hand side. This is known as the hut. I'm not quite sure what its original use was, um, but it does make a very useful backdrop uh, to Jekyll's planting, as you can see. And as you moved away from the house, the planting becomes uh, more, uh, has a greater freedom. And we do have some, is a very obvious elements, like there was a pergola, there was a nut walk. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. I've got a sort of plan of it. Uh, this actually I uh, photographed at um, an exhibition of Jekyll's, uh, uh, gardens. It's not in by her, it's by Henry Moon. Um, but it was on show at, um, I'm trying to think remember the name of the garden, but the important thing is it's shown you here the way in which she carefully planned uh, the colours of her garden, the silvery foliage at the base and uh, the, the tall blue flowers at the back, and it was on show at Hesterku, which you'll see in a minute. So here's the sort of thing I mean. Um, the, the verticality, I think, is really important. You've got campanula, you've got delphiniums, you've got hollyhocks, you've got lupins, and then you have lower plants, um, you know, at the foot of the border. And the border is very deep, and you would often have to put stepping stones in, otherwise you would never be able to get to the back of the border uh, to maintain it. This is the south border at Munstead, where all the colours are, as you can see, hot, uh, moving to the red hot pokers that she so favoured uh, in the centre. And here's uh, Helen Allingham committing to posterity a mixed jekyll border. And that, I think, is the gate looking into the kitchen garden area. This is by Thomas Hunt, again, another Edwardian watercolour artist who really made his money uh, painting these much bigger gardens. So the pansy garden here. And then this idea of a, a nut walk. Now the nut walk I'm actually showing you um, is Nancy Lancaster's. So I have a bit of a thing about Nancy Lancaster and the way that she developed the English country style and also uh, the English country garden. Haisley Court, Oxfordshire was her last home. And uh, she developed a nut walk there. And you can see on my rather nicely inscribed photograph at the top where some of these features were. There is the, there's the tank garden immediately behind the house. Uh, the nut walk took you down uh, to the pergola and the herbaceous border. And then you had the south terrace and the west lawn, which was more open. Then there was the kitchen garden, uh, which was beyond the spring and the summer garden, I understand. And that also took you out into more wild 
uh, woodland. So as you moved away from the house, it became increasingly informal. Uh, next door is an even more resplendent house, which I've never had the privilege of seeing. Uh, this is Orchards. Uh, Lutchens working for William and Julia Chase. And again, my photograph of it here is from Country Life. Particular feature here was the Dutch garden, artfully being posed, I think, by one of their children, where you get this wonderful sort of herringbone pattern in the brickwork, the inevitable kitten. And this again is a Country Life uh, photograph of what is described as the Dutch garden at orchards. And the Dutch garden seems to be distinguished by large pots, as well as lots of lavender. So here is my, one of my favourite uh, gardens, in fact, probably the best uh, Lutchen's G. Cool garden. This is Hester Coon. So this is known as the Dutch garden. And you can see again the silvery foliage uh, leading back to these big pots. I love the big pots. I'm a big pot gardener myself. Uh, Hester Coon have, as of course, the great or grand plat. The house is nothing to write home to mother about. Um, it was briefly ruined uh, by the Somerset Fire Brigade. Um, but it has the most wonderful 18th century garden as well as the uh, Lutchen's Jekyll edition. Now there's a pergola to die for and you really do need to have a pergola in an arts and crafts garden. You also need to have, if you're going to have a classic Lutchen's garden, a rill. These are magnificent. They lie to either side of the Grand Flat at uh, Hester Coombe and they were designed for planting uh, big lilies in fact. Uh, you can see what they're supposed to look like in the distance with lots of foliage around these things that look rather like donuts. And this, um, closer to home, Uckfield, Cluck, sorry, Cuckfield, West Sussex, Lee Manor, uh, which was altered for the Chance family of Orchard's fame. It wasn't enough for them to have the house at uh, Busbridge. They had to have a second one. And this is a genuine, in fact, um, late, well, I think late 15th, early 16th century house, uh, which uh, Lutchens did up and includes, of course, the rill in the foreground. So a lot of houses were done up. It all depends what you think of the doing up, how successful it was and how sensitive it was in terms of respecting the fabric of the original building. Some of the houses that were done up were quite modest. They would knock two or three into one, workers' cottages. Others were magnificent uh, farmhouses like this one. So Osbrook's farm at Capel seems to have got an upgrade. It's now known as Os Osbrook's Manor House and was restored by another really famous arts and crafts architect, Detmar Blow. Don't you love that name? Comes from Swindon, did a lot of work in the Cotswolds. Was an architect uh, of modern houses but was also very well known for restoring them. So on the bottom left-hand side is a watercolour of Osbrook's Farm Capel by Herbert Drain of 1885. And the photograph shows you uh, that what it looked like at about the same time or Edwardian era. This is a Lutchen's house that very few people know about and I therefore wanted to include it for that reason alone. This is Ruckman's estate. And if you partook in the, of the Leatherhead um, Arts Festival, there was actually a short film on about Ruckman's estate, uh, remodelled uh, by Lutchen's for the Lyle family twice. They needed it to get bigger as their family expanded. And you can see the Jekyll style garden to either side the big herbaceous border, and also not quite a pergola, but the, rose, the roses are sort of rambling round uh, that rather attractive wooden structure. Uh, so I'm going to end with two gardens that I got to know very well in the summer of 2019. One of them was Van at Hambledon, uh, which was the home of William Douglas Caro. And he also was a very well-known Edwardian arts and crafts architect. But he was also, like Detmar Blow, a very sensitive restorer. You see him in the top left-hand side. This is the official entrance to the house. If you look carefully on the porch, sort of banged in like nails, you have the date of the house and, in fact, Caro's um, initials. The garden in 2019 was 
in profusion, as you can see. I really do love hydrangeas. There's one on the right hand side. And this is the other side of, this is really when the garden starts. This is technically the back of it. But you sort of, you can hardly tell where the box is uh, and the borders end and the pathways start. It was a particularly good summer, if you remember. And so we have a lot of sort of Lutchen style brick pathways uh, cutting up the borders, the inevitable topiary. So we're looking the other way now. Out the, this is now behind me and we're looking out over the garden. And I'm moving you around it. And the wing that sticks out here on the right hand side um, is said to be one of the older sections of the house. This is not a new build, it's another uh, restoration. We've now moved around to the other side. And again, I'm, I've never been 100% certain uh, exactly what Caro did on this side in terms of extending those windows that run the whole way along the facade. There is uh, Mary Caro, who um, I only had the privilege of meeting that summer, 2019, twice. I'm sure you know that very sadly she died of COVID in April and we all really miss her. She, she was uh, one of those classic English grand dames in the nicest possible way, but you really could feel that she ran the empire. And uh, she was, she's been, a, you know, she has been lovingly looking after Van uh, since the demise of her father-in-law. Anyway, some more views of the garden. Look at the tile hanging, that's lovely. And the pergola is to die for with a big border to either side. It has a roughness to it, as you can see, from the way the, the narrow uh, bar stone is constructed. And we're looking down here uh, towards the lake. Um, these flowers to either side here are acanthus. I tried to grow those in my garden as well, but I didn't really do very well. Uh, here's the pond at the end of the pergola. And looking back at it, it has a really lovely little section, uh, which is covered rather like a sort of loggia uh, where, yes, you guessed it, we were having tea and biscuits. When should always enjoy oneself in the English country garden. There are quite a few interesting features as you go round, like the one on the left-hand side, that have been specially made for the garden. However, the bit that I like is the rill, but it's not a, a naked rill of the type at Hestercombe. This, again, is resplendent. You can just start making out the water. I'm standing in the middle uh, trying to get a good photograph of it and you can see the use um, you know it's, a, it's not perfect you know it's not it's not national trust uh, or I like it there's a, a dishabille element to it and here's a side view of what looks to be a border doesn't it but the rill is actually running down the center uh, what to do with your railway sleepers but what I really like here are the the topiary armchairs in the background where Mary used all the bottles of champagne and wine that they drank during the summer to make a basis here for her benches. This is something that I aspire to. And looking the other way, again, you've got the big borders, you've got the, the yew hedges, and you have an eye catcher at the end. Inevitably, the eye catcher here, in what appears to be rather like a topiary arbor, is a rather lovely Luxon's bench with some nice Nile lilies in pots to either side. And that is a good link to one of my last, my last two gardens. And this is Upton Grey. My link here, of course, is the arbour and the Luchens bench. And I'm at the bottom of the garden here with the tennis court behind me. Uh, the manor house at Upton Grey is, is just outside Surrey. I apologise, it's in Hampshire. I won't, don't be put off by me saying it's near Basingstoke, but it is. And this is restored by Ernest Newton, who our arts and crafts aficionados know as he created Buller's Wood for the Sanderson family, which has a magnificent Morris and Co interior. Um, the garden has been recently restored by Rosamond Wallinger. You can buy the books, you can read up on what has been the love of her life, the garden, getting it back. And it is a, is a bit like Hestercombe. It has a grand plat. It's sunken, as you can see. What really interests me about uh, Upton Grey is who acquires it and who has the building restored by Ernest Newton and the garden designed. It's Charles Home, better known to you as the uh, man behind the studio. 
the publisher of Old English Country Cottages, amongst many other books. There's, he looks quite a raconteur, doesn't he, with his cigarette? And then there's an illustration, the original watercolour, for one of the country cottages in the Old English Country Cottages publication. And his uh, book, which he edited, The Gardens of England, again, Edwardian. Most of the really important built, uh, books about the cottages and the gardens date to the Edwardian era. So here is the garden. He's blasted tourists all over it. Look at that. Admiring the, you know, I think, they're, I think it's Barstone again. Uh, it's certainly local. Um, the, these very distinctive uh, beds, which are then filled uh, with tall plants in the centre. There's uh, an acanthus over there. Again, they've done better than I ever have. And that's my husband up there taking a photograph of me. Uh, anyway, here I am looking out over what is in effect a grand plat with these uh, very formal um, architectural arrangements for this central section. We're looking down at it here. And again, the summer, you know, 2009, we had a profusion of flowers, as you can see. And uh, so if you really want to get into it, uh, Rosamond Wallinger, there's lots of photographs of the before and the after of the garden, the uphill struggle that she's had to bring it back. You know the, you know the story if you're a gardener. Here is the ubiquitous um, sundial. Uh, the year that we were there, 2019, we had many hollyhock delphiniums and it was just glorious. Just profusion everywhere. There's a nut walk, inevitably rather like uh, the one I showed you uh, from Hasley Court. The chickens are at the end of this particular um, uh, tunnelled walkway. And I'm going to leave you with the garden that I'm personally most fascinated by and frustratingly I have never seen, and that's Great Tangley Manor. We're back to Wanish, which is not far, I think, at Chinthurst is very close to this, but it's not on the hillside, it's down down the bottom, if I can put it that way. I would so love to visit this. And this is a watercolour of it by Anna Mary Richards Brewster. There's the sundial. Again, it's an old property, but why I am so fascinated, this is what it looks like today. You can hire it for the month if you've got 10 grand. Oh yes, I'd like that idea, but unfortunately it's out of my pocket. Um, but the reason that I'm so keen on it is not just because uh, the owner, who happened to be at the time Cyril Flower, he brings in Philip Webb to do up at Great Tangley Manor. But Cyril Flower has an even more beautiful London house. It's one I would dearly, again, uh, love to have seen in its heyday. This is Swan House. It's the exemplary Queen Anne style house by Richard Normanshaw on the embankment. It's called Swan House because there was a pub originally on this, on this site. It's, it's fabulous. The last changed hands were about 37 million. So definitely outside my bracket. And the two photographs of it are when it had its full uh, Morris & Co interior. Morris was so proud of the upper interior with the fireplace, Philip Webb, everything there structural, uh, in, uh, well, in, from a decorative point of view, like the settle and the overmantle is either Morris & Co or Philip Webb. And he was so proud of this interior that Morris used it in his catalogue for advertising what a Morris interior should look like. So that's the main reason I would like to get into Great Tangling Manor and see what Philip Webb did to it. What I can show you is the outside, this incredibly picturesque bridge, uh, which was, um, I, think, I think some of it was there before uh, Philip Webb arrived, but he certainly enhanced these features. And this is it from the other side. So that's the bridge that you're looking at here. Here it is down the bottom. When I say he enhanced things, I know that he enhanced uh, the garden wall here, uh, which might originally have been part of the uh, kitchen garden. But you can see it's been pierced by what looked like windows. That's courtesy of uh, Philip Webb. And this is uh, looking over the, the lawn. This is this long covered bridge so it's a covered walkway which becomes a covered bridge. It's immensely picturesque, as you can see. And there's this wall, which I'm assuming had something to do with the kitchen and garden, which Trillet Webb embellishes by punching holes through it and also creating this, uh, which was a, a rather, as you can see, fanciful 
uh, wooden gateway um, into the garden. That, by the way, is sadly no longer there. So my last couple of slides show you how artists like George Elgood and uh, Arthur Rowe, they uh, traveled all around England in the Edwardian period, capturing for us these much grander gardens, but which still really are dominated by features of the arts and crafts cottage garden. So the lily border here at Great Tangley Manor is by Thomas Hunn again, who we saw uh, painting the garden at Munstead Wood. So I leave you with some nice um, cheerful thoughts, because I'm not the best of gardeners, but I try. So uh, these are mostly courtesy of uh, Gertrude Jekyll. The love of gardening is a seed once sown that never dies. The lesson that I have thoroughly learnt and wish to pass on to others is to know that the enduring happiness that the love of a garden gives. I love this bit about a woman's place is in the garden and the garden is a grand teacher. It teaches patience and careful watchfulness. It teaches industry and thrift and above all, it teaches entire trust. However, I must say I like Audrey Hepburn's sentiment at the end uh, more than anything. To plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. We certainly need that, don't we, in the current climate. Uh, so Caroline was very kind. She mentioned my new book on Art Nouveau architecture. It does in fact have a section on Britain. It has quite a big section, in fact, on Macintosh and the Glasgow Four. But it does look, in fact, at the concept that there might have been an English um, Art Nouveau. It's not expensive. You'll be really pleased to know it is lavishly illustrated over 300 illustrations, and you'll find it on my Amazon page, along with all my other publications. Um, I post a lot of stuff on my website, which is anne-anderson.com, and I have my own YouTube channel, uh, where you'll find various long and short lectures. And if all has gone to plan, I hope to put this on my YouTube site and to leave it up there for about a month, so you can come back to it and watch it at your leisure.